Okay. All right. Now, go with me. This, just hey, just stay, stay with me. I can say I bought a, a, a story that I shared all the way back in 2011, I believe, to the pulpit with me. Other than that, we're just going to kind of walk through a couple of verses and share a little bit and then talk a little bit about the significance of this weekend and what it means to us and then hopefully close with a, with a good thought from the Lord this morning. If you're up to standing one more time, stand with me at least for the review, excuse me, for the God's prayer, and then we're going to hit the ground running. Father, it's so, so, so good to see people again who are part of this family that we've been blessed to be a part of for so many years. I pray your protection on them. I thank you for the faithfulness of their giving, for the love they have shown to us, for the love they have shown to each other throughout this process. And I pray even as we're back in smaller numbers that we'll continue, Father, to sense your presence and sense the, the need and the concern to check on each other and to reach out to our extended family, our friends, our neighbors, and our church family. And mostly again this morning, Father, we wouldn't want to be here unless you were here with us. And I pray you bless the word that you laid on my heart this morning. May it be when we leave here, we could say in our hearts, it was good. It was good to be in your house today. In Christ's name, amen. You may be saved. Just for a reminder. In case somebody asks you, pass the word. I'll try to remember to send an email. We're not going to live stream at least for another two to three weeks. Could be a month. Somewhere in that time frame. There's some things we need to purchase. There's some hard wiring that we need to get done in the, in the booth to help with the, with the signal that we have in here. And rather than send something out that's not quite up to snuff, we'd rather get it where we can do it well. We may even purchase another couple cameras. And so as soon as we can, it, that, that does appear to be something folks want us to continue doing, we will. But for purposes, but for this week, next couple of weeks, until we're able to live stream again, we'll just be videoing the service, this part of the message, and posting it at YouTube uh, each Sunday. John 15, the Lord said in verse 13, Greater love has no one than this, than one would lay down his life for his friends. Our Lord was talking about his sacrifice. He was talking to his disciples about what great love looks like. And the love that he was going to manifest for them in the very near future. The Bible also tells us in everything to give thanks. It? Aren't you thankful? I'm thankful I was born in this country. Aren't you? With all the faults of this country, I'm glad that by the grace of God, this is where I live. Aren't you? I'm thankful for God's watchful care over my family. I'm thankful for his watchful care over this nation. As much as I'm pro-military pro-defense spending in a big way, and I mean that, that's maybe the most political thing that I say from the pulpit. I recognize, folks, our defense of this land is more dependent on God than it is on our weapons of warfare. And we're at our best when we recognize that as a nation. On well, even on this day, I'm thankful aren't you first and foremost for Jesus being willing to die for my sins. I'm thankful that the greatest gift that's ever been given is the one described in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten, His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm thankful for the sacrifice also of those who served. And I'm thankful also for the sacrifice of those who died so that we can choose. I was with some folks this week that go to Ingleside, on staff at Ingleside. They were sharing with me the decisions that they were wrestling with. And we were back and forth. We recognized the size of our churches have an effect on the kind of decisions we're able to make about being able to be back at certain times. But I'm thankful to be in a country where churches can make independent decisions about when they feel best to make some incremental steps to be together. I'm thankful today we can come in here and worship freely without fear or favor of man. And again, I'm thankful to have a president. I, think, I don't think I've ever heard a president with all of his shortcomings and faults. And man, there are many who have said such kind things about the church. And a president who will make a point to say the importance that churches are. I consider churches pretty essential, don't you? And I'm glad to be in a country where a president would say such a thing. And I'm glad, as I said at the beginning, I'm so thankful that on a day like today we can talk about something that's way more important than COVID-19 has been. In a major wars, of the 20th and 21st century. Here's the listing of number dead that I got this week. 116,516 World War I. 405,639 World War II. 
In the Korean conflict, they called it. Now we say Korean War. 36,516. Vietnam. 58,209. If my records are right, the amount of days that we were serving in Vietnam from the beginning of the war to the end, 11 died a day on average. The Gulf War, 1999 294. Over 6,800 have been killed in Afghanistan and Iraq since 9 11. The most moving places I visited on vacation have been the military places that Leanne and I visited. Arlington National Cemetery, Cemetery, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. If you've never been, I highly recommend you go. Just being in Arlington is moving. Being that Tomb of the Unknown Soldier is equally as moving. But even for me still, to go out on the USS Arizona, the little ferry ride out to it, once you get on that boat, they ask, require you to be silent. So the whole boat ride out, Across the harbor, silence. While on the Arizona, silence. And the ride back, moving. To be standing on a ship that is in tune. Sailors who were on that tune, on that ship at the time, and some since that time. Lake Charles Krauthammer, who was one of my favorite people to follow on Fox News, said this about 9-11. It was our Pearl Harbor, he said. This time, however, the enemy had no home address, no Tokyo. It was an unconventional war by an unconventional enemy embedded within a worldwide religious community. Yet in a decade, he wrote this around 2011, we largely disarmed and defeated it and developed the means to continue to pursue its remnants at a rapidly decreasing cost. He said about our country, this is a historic achievement and now still, eight plus years later, nine, knocking on the door, we're still pursuing the remnants of the folks who were part of 9-11. Elizabeth Dole said this, while the brunt of the attacks fell on New York, Pennsylvania, and Washington, hometown heroes all across, across America joined in service to the government. They stood tall, determined, to ensure a safer America for their families and their children and their grandchildren. She goes on, in small towns in the heartland, on the ghost, communities are missing their stars. They're missing family and loved ones. Their lives have been forever changed because of the sacrifice. Local heroes have returned. Some will steal the ravages of war, apparent. She concludes, the, patience, the passion, the patriotism, and the perseverance of this generation of hometown heroes has been humbling to witness. General John Kelly, whatever you think of him in his time of serving as the chief of staff of the president, is one of our great general heroes in this country. He's the highest decorated person in the last 20 years of our country to lose a child in combat. He lost him in these effects around 2010. He says, it was 16 a.m. on November 9, when a free general, he is Joseph Dunford, showed up at his house. He was dressed in uniform and his wife was with him. As a Marine Corps general, General Kelly said, I knew immediately why my friend had come at such an hour. Immediately my mind went to all the condolence letters I've written, all the times I've tried to explain how grateful a nation was and how meaningful and noble and worthy the life that was sacrificed was for the, just a moment. He said all these emotions started cascading on me before my friend even spoke. He said, I guess over time I convinced myself that I could imagine what it would be like. What it would be like to lose a son or a daughter in service to this country. He said, but this moment I knew I couldn't come close. It is unimaginable for families. His friend talked to him. His friend shared the news. And a few months later, Jim R. Kelly wrote, I, did, did, I then did the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. I walked upstairs where my wife 
Carrie was sleeping. And I woke her to this news. And for the first time that I knew of in my life, I broke her heart. Just think with me for a moment, because we've been more insulated in our generation and time than the group that was serving in World War I and II and Korea and Vietnam. 6,800 times plus this scene has played out since 9-11. 58,000 times during the Vietnam conflict. 36,000 plus Korea. Between World War II and World War I, over 520-something thousand times. So it seems good to me to be reminded as we go to the lake or as we have family over or we, have, we, we sit by a fire pit or we camp out or we just take it easy this weekend, just be good to be reminded that the freedom that we breathe has been paid for with significant sacrifice. It was four days later from the writing of this letter that General John Kelly wrote the story that I brought again to the pulpit with me this morning. He was speaking at the Semper Fi Society in St. Louis, Missouri. He purposely, purposely didn't want any mention of his son or his son's sacrifice. He was there for a greater cause. He began to speak to remind everybody what we're still reminding every day. It's about 1% of our population is serving in the military. In this volunteer force, it's about 1% of the families extended that are really affected. They're giving so much. He goes on to share about these two Marines. I love all the military service, and this story is not because my dad was in the Marines, but it's just the most moving thing that I've come across in all my years as pastor that kind of hones in the sacrifice and the bravery of these men and women who serve for us. I'm going to be looking down at it as I go, but I want to make sure I get it right, especially since we're being videoed. So bear with me. I hope I look up enough that you know I'm here with you and we're connected. Say two years ago, again, this is in 2010, Two years ago, when I was the commander of all the U.S. forces in U.S. and Iraqi forces, on 22 April of 2008, two Marine infantry battalions were switching out in Ramadi. One, one battalion in the close, closing days of their deployment was going on, and one was taken over for them. Two Marines, Corporal Jonathan Yale and Corporal Jordan Hatcher, 22 and 20 years of age respectively from each battalion were assuming watch together at the entrance gate of the outpost that contained a makeshift housing for 50 Marines and 100 Iraqi police of which General Kelly called the Iraqi police folks that serve our people, my men, he said my allies, our allies they were there for the fight in what was one of the most hot places in Afghanistan in Iraq, excuse me, Ramadi a city at that time called the most dangerous city in the world. Yale was a dirt poor, this is his description, mixed race kid from Virginia with a wife and daughter and a mother and sister who lived with him, all on $23,000 a year. Harder grew up in the middle class area of Long Island. Two completely different worlds, two completely different families. Joined together because they were brothers as Marines. They probably never would have met. They were Marines, though. Combat Marines, he said. Forged in the same crucible of Marine training. They had a bond as close as brothers or closer. The mission order, probably from the sergeant, went something like this. I love his phrase here. Okay, you two clowns. Stand at your post and let no unauthorized vehicle pass while you're clear. Then they relieved the two other Marines and took watch at what was called, if you want to look this up later, Joint Security Station Nasser in the Sophia section of Ramadi, Al Anbar, Iraq. A few minutes later, a blue truck turned down the alley. Perhaps 60 to 70 yards in length, a mosque 
should you? 67 yards, it sped its way through all the little bays. Notice the pictures we see of all the little concrete bears that have it, it is just zooming around them. Fast as it can go. It detonated, killing both of them catastrophically. 24 brick masonry houses were damaged or destroyed. A mosque 100 yards away collapsed. The truck engine came to rest 200 yards away, almost knocking a house down. Two infantrymen died. Probably 2,000 pounds of explosives, they figured. But it was not in the DNA of these two Marines to run. They saved 50 Marines and 100 Iraqi police. He gets the report. General Kennedy says immediately when he gets this report, he said, something struck me here. It's not unusual for Marines and others to die and be willing to die, but something about this report just jumped at me. And I just thought, I've got to find out more. He called the regimental, regimental commander. He just removed, just came back from the site, and he agreed. All they had was the witnesses and Iraqi police. He wanted these two Marines to be awarded a significant medal. And he knew with just a word of Iraqi police it would never happen. He flies all the way to Ramadi the next day. He arrives. He interviews the Iraqi police. This is what he heard. Many were injured, some seriously. They spoke to him. One was, he said, with tears in his eyes. Any normal man would run. They run like a normal man would to save his life. What those Iraqi police did not know and what they learned was these were not ordinary men. The Iraqi interviews went on. One said with emotion to me, Sir, in the name of God, no sane man would have stood there and did what they did. They saved us all. What we didn't know at the time, and he only learned a couple of days later, kind of like our fire here, we were able to salvage one of the, one of the hard drives of our fire, which is what helped Georgia Power and our insurance company to know exactly how our fire started. A couple of days later, they found out. He, he, a couple of days later, they found out one of their cameras had recorded the events. General Kelly watched the report immediately. Recommends these two men for Navy crosses. He said you can watch the last six seconds and get a glimpse of what these people do for us. He said, he said, I was gonna watch the last six seconds before the camera went blank. I put myself in the heads of these two Marines as I watched the video. He says, I suppose it took about a second. About a second. For them to get their rifle up. Exactly no time to talk it over. They had no time to call the sergeant, find out what to do. Only a half an instant to get the weapons and aim. At this moment, they got about five seconds to live. He said, I figure maybe two seconds watching it for them to present their, way, their weapons and take aim and start firing. By this time, the truck was halfway up the barriers and gaining speed the whole time. Here the recording shows the Iraqi police, some, of who, had already, some who had already fired their AKs, now scattering like the normal and rational men they were. Some running right past these two Marines. Three seconds to live. For about two seconds more, the recording shows the Marines' weapon firing nonstop. The truck's windshield exploding into shards of glass as their rounds taken apart and tore into the body. I had to delete what General Kelly called the person driving the truck who was trying to get past them to kill their brothers. 
And he sent all their brothers. The American Marines and the Iraqi bedded down in the barracks who were totally unaware that their lives at that moment depended entirely on two Marines on watch. If they had been aware, they would have known they were safe because two Marines stood between them and a great suicide bomber. He goes on the recording shows the truck careening to a stop immediately in front of the two Marines. In all the instantaneous violence, Yale and Harder never hesitated. By all reports, and he said now more importantly by the recording, they never stepped back. They never started to step aside. He said they never shifted their weight. With their feet spread apart, shoulder width, they leaned into the danger, firing as fast as they can work their weapons. They have now a second to live, and the truck explodes. The camera went blank, and two young men went to their God. Six seconds, not a lot, not enough time to think about your family, your country, your flag, about their lives or their death, but more than enough time for two very brave young men to do their duty, he described it, into eternity. And he said to the Simplified Society, that's the kind of people who were on watch all around the world for you and I today. We Marines believe, he said, that God gave America the greatest gift he could bestow on man while he was on this earth, freedom. And along with our soldiers and sailors and airmen and U.S. Customs and our Border Patrol and our Coast Guardsmen and Marines, we're here to safeguard that gift and guarantee that no force on this earth can ever steal it away. Simplify is short for simplified Ellis. In short description, it means always faithful, always loyal. Get in our cars and we drive out and we go and do and live and breathe. Because there's young men and women all around the world. And some older folks also who help and manage things in civilian world and the military world. And they go around the world so that hopefully those folks can't come here. It cause us harm. They're on the wall somewhere today. They're away from their families today. And it just seemed to me on this particular moral day when it'd be easy to bemoan all that COVID has taken from us and caused the inconvenience to be reminded for centuries, families in this country have been mightily inconvenienced so that we can live free and be the people that we strive to be to the glory of God, hopefully. More importantly, let me close here. The only way to really be free is to be free in Christ. A nation is only truly saved when God is the God of that nation. That's why the psalmist made clear we don't put our trust in chariots, put our trust in the Lord. You're not safe, truly safe, unless you are resting in the assurance that comes from the unmerited, unmatched grace of Almighty God given to us freely through the sacrifice of His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Can I remind you, Christ had not six seconds he had eternity to contemplate the sacrifice he would be called to make on behalf of our salvation. And he didn't flinch either. 
For God so loved the world. He gave His only begotten. His one and only Son. That whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. On this Memorial Day, the best decision we can make this weekend would, would be to know that we are followers of Jesus Christ. Amen? I pray that you go this weekend and as you enjoy whatever the weekend holds for you, the message this morning would at least be a, a reminder of the sacrifice that's paid regularly so that we can worship freely and go about and do the things that we do. Amen? God bless the church. Isn't it good to see each other? Oh yeah, that's okay. That's okay. It's good to see you. All right. Practice social distancing as you go out. And just remind you what I tried to try to share to a few. When you see a lot of folks kind of close together, they're extended family. They've been around each other. They've been hunkering down, hugging, loving. Some are close friends who've been close friends a long time. They decide that they want to go out. They're going to go out with their friends. Now, they've been seeing their friends. They've been away from here. So you see folks a little closer and you go, that's all it is. They've been around each other. They've built up. It's kind of an interesting phrase we throw around. Herd immunity. <laughs> I don't like that. I'm trying to watch what I'm eating, so I'm trying not to feel like I'm part of a herd. <laughs> Aren't you? Good to ask you something to you. God bless you. Pray for the board. I say again, the decision to cancel services was much easier than the decision to resume services and then to resume the next, the next level of services. And just so, just give wisdom, not just our church. There's lots of good churches all around this area that are wrestling with those same decisions. Give us wisdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for men and women serving on behalf of our country and the world so that we can worship freely today. Pray especially again that you be with Miss Purvis. Oh, Father, prove faithful to her. Remind Ron and Gail William, the whole family, that she's in your hands. Again, we pray you be with Mary. Just love on her. We give you praise. We give you praise for this news on Butch. And we give you praise that we've met now for two Sundays and hopefully safely have met. Pray you watch us over us this week. Give us wisdom and guidance in the days ahead, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless the church.